So remember when we talk about um, 3D transformations, we talked about translations, we talked about scales, but I left out rotations, right? If you search online, then most people tend to do rotations. They encode them in a 3D matrices. We just multiply that way, which I think is quite cumbersome just for rotation. You need nine floats for a rotation matrix. matrix. It might be faster uh, on the GPU, but again, that's just, it's a pain in the ass to make. And um, even though there are some rote routines that you can copy from online, it's not very, it's not an elegant such a solution in my opinion. Well, um, typically when you search online, this is what you get for uh, 3D matrices, right? So either you have rotation around X, rotation around Y, and rotation around Z. These three formulas are quite straightforward, but when you look at rotate around axes, which they also have a formula for produce a matrix that does that around an arbit any arbitrary axis, it gets very messy, right? Well, today, what I'm going to talk about is, uh, in my opinion, a more powerful and more compact representation of 3D rotations. It's called a quaternia. So, um, more specifically, we're going to be talking about union quaternions. So, quaternions. What is that? So, remember, uh, either in high school or middle school, you've encountered numbers like these, right? These are called complex numbers. There's a component of a real real part, real component, and there's a, a imaginary number with a coefficient. So the quaternion is basically the four dimensional version of that. It has a real component. So this is just complex number there. Right? This is quad quaternion. It has one real component, but has three imaginary component with different uh, imaginary coordinates. So they have i, j, k. These are three different imaginary numbers. In addition to that, the, 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 the equation of the relation between i, j, k is also given. So i squared equals, you know, in here, i is denoted as i squared equals negative one. So here, of course, i squared, j squared, k squared, all being imaginary numbers, they are equal to negative one, right? But before, before they equal to negative one, they also equal to something else. Actually, this is the I equal to i, j, k, and it leads to some interesting computations that we'll see later on. So why is this representation useful for rotation, right? I'm not going to dig into the math of it. I think Blue Brown has a good video on it. Here, I'm only going to talk about the part of quaternion that's directly related to how we implement the rotations. So um, you can stay for that, right? I'm not gonna talk about the deep mathematical meaning of all these things. So here, very straightforward. Um, let's say we wanna construct, um, typically the way you construct a quaternion is you're given an axis, let's call this V, and you're given a rotation angle and you wanna produce unit quaternion that represents a rotation that rotates delta uh, theta amount of angle around V, right? It's actually incredibly simple the way you do it. So Q equals, here's another, um, by the way, so you can see that in a quaternion, let me just try to add one more point that we can move back to how to construct a quaternion. So look at the quaternion construct. I, J, K terms are always there, right? A more the way we can represent a quaternion in our code is to just store the four coefficients the coefficient for the real term and the three for the other imaginary co uh, components right so i typically write it in this way well this is this is the built-in gls vector 4d vector my x is um i'll denote x as the coefficient of i y as the coefficient of j z as the coefficient of k and w as the real component so get used to this notation um, so quaternion is very simple. So it's just the x is multiplied with the sine of theta over two and the cosine of theta over two. And this results into a 3D vector. And this is a scalar, right? So if you combine them, it results to a 4D vector. 
and each of the components of this 4D vector is the coefficients to their corresponding terms. The reason why this is the setup this way, I don't know, but if you apply it through the math, then it all checks out. So, so there you go. Then this 4D vector will encode the quaternion that represents this particular rotation in 3D space. Um, okay, great. We got some 4D vector that represents our quaternion, but how do we use it as rotation, right? So um, typically in 3D graphics, your your thing, um, whatever objects you're rendering, if you're doing a traditional rasterization style, you will have a bunch of vertices light out in space, right? So what you do to them is you take the point and you rotate it, you apply the rotation to each vertex in the 3D space. Well, in, in our sense, uh, either we, we do rasterization, I'm actually I'm going to demonstrate quaternion in the I shared it twice, so we're going to do it in the context of procedural program, I mean, procedural rendering, which uses a ray marching step. Uh, now recall that we're going to test, use the point in 3D to test against the distance from the point to the object. The trick to other transformations is that you can apply the inverse transformation to the space which contains the object. And here we can do the same trick. We can apply the inverse transformation of this quaternion to the space that contains the object. So we're going to rotate the space instead of you know, the object directly, since there's no way to do it because it's stored in implicit form. So quaternion. We need, now recall that um, when we do transformations, we'll do it on the P in our ray tracing step. So let me just give you a refresher real quick. So P is SDF, and sphere SDF, um, object SDF. So one thing I could do here, right, is, let me just try to lift out the object SDF. Okay, never mind. Um, I'm just gonna do translation P. Like three. I'm pulling out the common vector that I was using just to show you what we're doing, right? We're doing operations on P, which is the point we're testing in space. If I try to change the P, you can see that the object gets translated, right? Well, same thing. If we want to do translation, we do the inverse of translation on the points. If we want to do rotation of Q, we do the inverse of Q on the transformation, I mean, on the point that we're testing. So what we really want is to somehow um, have P prime, which is the rotated point, PQ. Somehow we want to have a procedure that produces the rotated point from P and Q, right? So how do we do that? Write this out again. Well, the way you do that is quite, um, I guess, quite easy to memorize. It's Q multiplied by P multiplied by Q negative one. What? It's kind of weird here. Well, this is a notation you often see. It's, it's weird that um, we're multiplying quaternion with the point, since the point is 3D and a quaternion is 4D, right? And they're diff of different types, so this doesn't make sense. So let me just add a quick F here. And f is some uh, function that turns our quaternion, I mean, it turns our point into a quaternion. And the way we're going to do that is to return a 4D vector of the following. We're just going to uh, put x, y, z into each imaginary coordinates that put 0 into the real part. So there you go. That's how we compute it. Now, as you can imagine, we're not just going to multiply these vectors since you know it's a complex number and for complex numbers or quaternions they have their own rules of how you want to multiply these coefficients they don't map linearly to just a regular 4d vector multiplication uh, in fact why don't we examine how to do the inverse of a quaternion actually so a quaternion oh god i have to write this out again i really wish i'll have some infinite painting that's um uh, i know milton but so for some reason, Milton doesn't work with my pen, so that's a, that's a bummer. All right, so this is uh, the axis rotation form. 
the inverse of that rotation is literally um, the inverse of that rotation is applied negative signs to the angles. So instead of turning along a direction, depending on your handedness of the coordinate system, you instead do the opposite of rotation, right? That's, you know, by definition of the inverse of the rotation. So, now recall that negative theta of sine, I mean, sine of negative theta, you can take out the negative sign here. And for the cosine of negative theta, it's just negative, uh, just cosine of theta. The negative, whether or not it's negative, it doesn't matter, right? Because, um, what is it called? Uh, the function of the cosine is symmetrical along, you know, if, if you do a reflection from neg the negative x part to the positive x part, part they're going to be the same value. And uh, conceptually, conceptually, if we do a unit circle, this is, you know, positive, this is negative. If you look at the cosine term, which is, you know, let me just write them out, x, z x over z is going to be the same, which is, you know, x over z is actually the cosine of theta, and for both positive and negative angle, we're going to result into the same uh, same result, same ratio, right, you know, due to the property of cosine. So there you go. Um, a more simplified way to say it is that, for so for the imaginary number coefficients, we just negate them, and for the real part, we just keep it the same. So a Q is inverse would just be negative x, negative y, negative z, and w. It's really uh, straightforward. The only part we're left over is how to multiply these uh, these things. How to multiply quaternions. That's the only hard part, which I don't even have a firm grasp on. So I'm going to try to explain and lead you to the right resources. Actually, I do have a firm grasp on them, but I do not know. I can't derive them. You know, reliably because you know we do need to do some uh, clever sub substitutions I'll, I'll tell you how you typically do it like the standard procedure and see if you can figure this out yourself so um, all right now why don't we start with complex numbers what do we what do we go back to high school so the way you do it is you just distribute right you just I don't know what is called in America it's called foil so AC, you just distribute the things out, you just take them out, right? BI plus uh, BI times C plus BI times DI, all right? So you group up all the, uh, the complex terms and the uh, real terms. So AC is real plus um, this term is actually also real because if you multiply two I's, it results in negative one. So you multiply basically negative BD, then you plus uh, these are the terms of the i, so ad plus bc with an i term. So if you uh, separ try to separate them into their own categories, then you result into a complex number you know, that follows this multiplication rule. So um, you can imagine that because quaternions are just 4D uh, uh, analogous of complex number, we're pretty much just do the same process. We follow them out where you just do distributions as well. Except there's one tricky part, right? So before, um, it's too late. Now remember how quaternions, besides their, um, let me just write it out in uh, the standard math way that you would do it. K, C, K, plus D. Or D is the real component. And C, D, E, F, G, H. So we got two quaternions. This is, um, let's call this A and call this B. Now, if we do them, right, we try to distribute them. F. GK plus H. Now, if you try to, um, okay, so for the first term, it's quite straightforward. It's just a negative AE, right? But when you hit the second term, we, okay, so it becomes AF multiplied by IJ. How do we, so the result quaternion needs to be in the same form as 
the standard one. We only want one coefficient with i, one coefficient with j, I, one coefficient with k, and a real number part. We don't have the term ij, and there seems like there's no straightforward way to reduce ij into any of these imaginary coordinates. All right, this is where this comes into uh, comes into play. Remember, this is the the um, extra information about quaternions. It's this. So, how do we solve for ij? Well, interestingly, we could uh, do clever substitutions with these things. This is what I was talking about. So, ijk equals negative one. This is the given. And we can apply k by multiplying it on the right side of everything, right? IJK. And these two k's, they, they, they also, you know, by following this rule, k squared equals negative 1. So negative ij equals negative k. Therefore, ij equals k. And you do that for all these terms. You can try them to, to do them do them here, but I'm not going to attempt because I'm probably going to end up with some mistakes and probably not even enough space to put on the sketchbook thingy. So I'm just going to point you to the website that gives you all the right um, formulas. Okay, IJ equals K, I did right. Um, one, one thing to note is that, um, yeah, these things are useful. Uh, I guess you can look at the Wikipedia to kind of try to derive them. The problem I have is because I it's it's tricky to do the substitution because um, one property of this relation actually one of the contradicting properties I j equals j j i. You will expect them to be equal to each other, but they're not. So multiplication between complex different complex coordinates essentially becomes non-commutative. And you have to be careful with that. Do your left for multiplica multiplication, do your right multiplication. There are actually different results. But again, if you follow the Wikipedia, you're probably all set. So, we need the final equation here. All right, so this is the kind of, well, which is A? Okay, there we go. Um, so the rotation followed by. All right. Um, yeah. So A is the real part, and B, C, D. So you can see they separated out the real part and the imaginary parts, right, into four uh, four different parts. So that's useful. We could just you know copy this equation off and then you know make these each coefficients into the terms that uh, we want. So we have a routine for doing that re recall that we use quaternions as um, or, or you, particularly unit quaternions. Uh, so the, the quaternions are of uh, one one length one. So remember that rotation can be applied. Just define a rotate routine here. Q is a quaternion, P is a point, and this is just going to return. Q plus times the the mystery f function that translates p into a quaternion, then multiply by negative quaternion, and negative q, inverse of q. Excuse. Me. Um, that's the result, and we know how to do f. We know how to do inverse, and we know how to do multiplication. It's just two quaternion multiplications here. Quite straightforward. Um, so why don't we go ahead and implement it in the code just to show you the effect of unit quaternions encoded as the rotations. So, let's write up the routines that we need. The annotation is all messed up, which is surprising. Not surprising, actually. It's quite common. So we need first the you know, construction of the quaternion. So quad, this is going to be the, the, the constructor equivalent of the thing. So I'm going to pass in an axis, I'm going to pass in an angle, which returns V times sine A over 2, cosine of A over 2, that's the quaternion. Then I have the conjugate or inverse, essentially. I think most people call this conjugate, but then the effect of conjugate is really the inverse of it. 
So I'm just going to call this inverse. Hopefully you don't have any, uh, the math people don't have a problem with me. So instead what you do is just um, back for expand math to negative x, y, z, and then keep the, keep the real term still real. I mean, the same, the real term the same, and flip the signs for all the imaginary coefficients. Then the last part, well, I guess, p to q, it's hilarious term here. So remember, we need that imaginary function f right here, which is going to be p to q, which, you know, it just means translate to p to q. So it's going to be 0. All right. The final, the big one here is the multiplication. Right? So it's going to be Q1 and Q2. You know, there's a strong chance that we get this wrong, but we're just try to follow the equation here. So we code up. So these are the four components. Remember the last component, W, which is we're going to use it for you know, representing the real part. So Q. So that's the real uh, real component of the thing and look at real number because because we're using different conventions it's really hard to you know, follow this and make sure everything's correct so q1 dot uh, x multiplied by q2 dot w Q1 dot C, which is you know, Y in case Q2 dot D, which is C. This one's cracked down. Q1 dot Z multiplied by Q2 dot Y. Oh boy. Q1 dot W is. Q1 dot x to the c plus q1 dot y last term. And just for safety measures, I'm going to normalize them. Actually, you're required to normalize them because they're unit, you know, they're, they're unit vectors. I mean, unit quaternions. It's just so the result of multiplication will be normalized. Okay, I think that's all we need to make our final procedure, which is rotate. And it takes in a coin and it takes in a quaternion. All it's going to do. It's just Q multiplied by P to Q, P multiplied by quad inverse of Q. Actually, instead of subrotation, the more straightforward construction is having a vertex and the angle instead, then we construct a quaternion inside our procedure. So the user only have to acknowledge the fact that there's a Rotation axis or uh, angle and the point that you try to rotate. So Q is quad V A. That'll be it, right? Apparently not. They're not they're not happy with it. What's this one? Oh, Q ball, of course. Q ball. Right, the result of this is still a quaternion, which we just take the XYZ component. What? What do you mean? 
Q multiplies two four four D quaternions, right? So Q, what is Q? Is it four D quaternion? P two Q is a four D quaternion. I'm not sure why you're complaining. I'm not quite sure. Let me just try to. Still got no matching overload function found. Okay. Q. Let's do the inverse of that. All right, so ostensibly, this should be the rotation quaternion here. So remember, we're going to apply this to the points that we're testing. So it's going to be, let me just pull this out. So SDF, the strange object, it's just. Uh, Okay. So what we're going to do is before P gets passed to anything, we're going to rotate it. You know, let's just say we're rotated along the y-axis. So because we're using a left-handed coordinate system, we call the camera system. Uh, when we do rotation, it's going to ro rotate. If you, if you look at the thing from top down, then it's going to rotate it clockwise, right? Because it's going to be along your left hand. So zero one zero. Okay, something is wrong, which is expected. I time. Well, it's kind of cool, right? I'm not sure which part of the messed up though. Because one little miscalculation lead to this. Hmm. Well, isn't this interesting? I think already the videos are 30 minutes long. Oh. Wait, this thing is X? What? I don't think there's. Uh, okay, this is the last term. You know what? I'm gonna call for rescue here. I'm gonna go to my alternate account and see what I did with the rotation there. Um, I think I have. Where do I have rotation? I have rotation here. It's a quad. Okay. Humo. Just oh my god. Don't look at this. This is just okay. This is just a clever trick with dark product cross product, which is essentially what you know. It, it becomes the same uh, computation essentially. All right. So why don't we try to match with you know our equation again? So W. E. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Live coding. That this is the uh, the bang of life coding. You can't avoid moments like these. 
or you just when you're just absolutely embarrassing yourself. I don't know where it is. What if I don't normalize? Oh, hey. Why did I normalize again? Okay, I normalized trying to preserve the uniquaturnium, but... Realize that this step, we're actually computing the result. So if we put, you know, if we're, concat we're concatenating two quaternions, then yes, we would need to normalize it. But here, the multiplication does not serve the purpose of concatenating quaternions. It serves as computing the final, final result of the, you know, the rotation. So that's why it can't um, normalize here. Well, trust me that you still need to normalize quaternions. If these quaternions are all normalized. You can just try to add normalize everywhere. It's going to work the same, except in the final computational step of bringing out the the, the last point where you, you cannot normalize this. I uh, forgot about that. It's been a while since I've done quaternions. I've always had just built-in libraries that does it for me. So quaternions, one last feature of quaternions is that you can do interpolations. Which is really cool. So, let's see. Um, how about we get okay? So let's say we don't do any rotation here. Okay, now we need quaternions. Because we're gonna feed in a, a huge rotate routine instead of, you know, axis and angle, and you will see soon, very, uh, very soon, why that that's the case. So Q1 is the so rotate one is the rotation state. And we're gonna be in, which is gonna be no rotation. So wait, why do I have this? It's just quaternion like three zero one, and then nothing. The, the, the second rotation state is quaternion. Um, same, except there is, it's going to rotate all the, way, all the way to the back. So do I have pi here? I don't know. So let's just say eyeball it and say it's 1.7. Then the actual rotation, you're, okay, here you actually have to normalize them. And you have to multiply them by the inverse order. There's a lot to talk about quaternions. The inverse order is because um, the, one, the intuition that you want, want to use to remember this is that, so recall that the quaternions so Q multiplied by points times Q negative one in order to concatenate a rotation after this point. So let's kill one Q1, Q1, Q1. When you multiply something that's on the outset of what, what we already have, right? So you, you remember now these terms are applied right when we call the rotate routine. And while we're trying to compute the results quaternion that, that encodes these rotations, we're only with dealing with these parts here. So this is the result of why you see, you know, you want to apply rotation one first, then two, then three, but you write the quaternion multiplication in order of three to one. So this is why the, the apparent reversed order of quaternion, quaternion multiplication. So, I want to do this. Actually, I don't, I don't, I'm not concatenating them. I'm just mixing them. I'm just uh, lurping. So now just R. Oh! Okay, this is a good example. Okay, this is this this is awesome. So my i time is just going to be the result. How do I bond? Wait, what? Okay, bond. 
So, okay, here we go. This is an awesome example. Awesome example time. So I'm rotating the cube, but somehow it's um three. Oh, see that? Oh wait, hold on. It's not supposed to. All right, you know what? I'm just gonna. I don't want this jitter. It's not part of the artifacts. I'm just gonna say it's five. five. All right, so. You can see, even though I'm only rotating the object, it also scales it, right? Because the mixing operation, it does not produce a unit quaternion, even though the two inputs are both unit quaternions. So you kind of like, you have two quaternions, right? Imagine this is the 4D hypersphere, you know, because there are 40 vectors that can represent, be represented that way. So if you have two vectors, if this is the actual rotation curve, if you want to find something that's halfway on it, you actually have to go onto the curve and that's the, then you draw a vector out there, that's the quaternion you want. But instead what we do is we're mixing these two intermediate points and this, the result in, it turns out is this, right? So what we want to do is to normalize it back to the normal, to back to the curve, but in actuality, you can never, there's always a small error if you just mix these two quaternions together. The more accurate operation you're going to do is slurp, but I'm not going to cover it here because lerp is usually good enough, almost always good enough. So what you want to do is to, you know, right now, right now we're here. I want to try to get to there. How do we do that? We just normalize it. So there you go. The shadow is a little janky, but deal with that. Try to deal with that. Um, there you go. Now there's no um, there's no scaling and shearing happening because the quaternion has been clamped to be normalized, and uh, that's about it. This is how you can rotate in 3D space with unit quaternions. Very powerful stuff. Right. I'll see you next time.